he just missed his footing on, a, on an icy rock and just slipped and we went straight down the side, 100 feet down the mountain, bouncing, hitting rocks, screaming. He was absolutely terrified. I think he thought his life was over. And he, he was, he then eventually stopped, hit a rock at the summit 100 feet down and just slid into it and he's just lying there. And eventually waved his hand like to say he was okay, he survived it. And I'm like, goodness sake. And then that guy directly in front of me, he put his foot in the same place where that guy just slipped and he went as well, 100 feet straight down the side of the mountain. It almost, he was terrified, he was swearing his head off in, in terror. He really thought he'd had it. And the same again, he's hit a few rocks, bounce, 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 and then came to an ending. And uh, he, he was moving, and he probably wasn't in my team, so I just cracked on. But my next step, where those two had slipped, I don't think I've ever put my foot down more carefully in my entire life. Where'd you grow up? Just about that. Where'd you grow up? Easy start. Yeah. Uh, grew up in the northeast of England, a place uh, Stockton on Tees, next to Middlesbrough, the mighty borough. So I was there till I went to college. Went to college in Leeds, uh, studied four years left there and then basically I've been wandering for almost all over the place since then. I did a year, I went as a PE teacher, so taught PE for one year, then a bunch of mates, we decided to run the world. That was back in the day when gap years didn't exist in those days, that was what, 30 odd years ago, 40 years ago. So we had a gap year, the four of us, and uh, travel around the world. And I found it really hard to settle, to be honest, when I came back, ended up skiing and every winter I'd go back to the States and spend my winter skiing. So it was really hard to get settled back into normal life after being a hedonist for such a long time. What was home life like for you growing up? Mum and dad at home? Mum and dad at home, uh, two sisters. It was a, a, I had a great upbringing. Mum and dad were great. You know, I went to a local church. Uh, just, just a, 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 I was just blessed really, blessed with a, just a really steady, great Christian family home. So I never got no hardship there whatsoever. Did you have any indication that as a younger lad growing up that you had this sort of ultra ability in you, this ultra marathon heart or desire? I think not for the ultras. I don't think they ex even existed and I had no idea. But my dad was a big man for the mountains. So he was, I think he's probably climbed every mountain in the Lake District at least 10 times. And every holidays, we'd be in the mountains. And so I was, I was brought up in the mountains, so that was my background. So I think in the heart of ultra racing is adventure. That's right, for me, that's what it's all about. And so I was brought up on adventures with my dad, and, uh, and he'd take me all over the place. It's, you know, I think I was 18 months, the first climb the mountain on my dad's back. So it was just, just a, I had an apprenticeship in the mountains, I suppose, and uh, got that love of it. What is it about the mountains that draws so many people, do you think? Good question. I guess it's different things to different people. To me, I, I just love the challenge of climbing mountains. I love being out in the open air. It's just, and also I love when there's a bit, a bit of danger. So just to kind of, you know, not, I'm not an extreme mountaineer by any means whatsoever, but if there's two ways of a mountain, I'd rather take a route that just involves just a, a, a tiny bit of risk, really, within reason, just so it feels like an adventure. And I think it's an opportunity. In, in modern day life, I think it's really hard to find opportunities where you think, I'm, I'm going to have an adventure today. And the mountains always seem to provide an opportunity to find something. And I think that's the, the big appeal for me. Yeah. So you've, you've obviously not always been a runner. You, you were into football. Like, yeah. To go into ultra running and what you've done, it's quite a big sort of transition. What, what was your initial interest in sport? How did you get into sport? Yeah. I always played football as a kid, and then obviously I was a PE teacher, so sport was my life. And then I transitioned from, from PE and sport, and then eventually been skiing became my life. So I was constantly skiing every year, doing seasons. And then uh, I came back from that, and when I settled down, got married, then it got into football, and I just played for a local side, uh, 11 a side Saturdays, training during the week, and my life was football. And then I ran a side. And when it got to the stage where I, I couldn't even pick myself, I wasn't good enough anymore, I had to find something else to keep fit. And I'd read a couple of books on ultra running, and it just, it just interested me to think, you know, that thought, how far can I run before I can't run any further? You know, just finding your limits. And that, that really intrigued me to know. And I also wanted, I always like to think of myself, you know, I think, when the going gets tough, am I, am I tough enough to keep going? And I just start challenging yourself to see what, sort of person you really are inside when, th when, when the wheels come off. And, uh, and I'd read so many books and how people react differently to it. And it was, I thought, I've got to, got to try this. 
Wow. So, so an unanswered question in you, am I, am I tough enough? Can I do this? What's my limitations? Well, definitely. Yeah, you, you just don't know, do you? There's, there's so... Because I'd had such an easy life, I know some guys will sit there and say, you know, I had a traumatic childhood. Things were so difficult for me. I had to dig deep from being a kid. Uh, things were tough. I'd, I'd never read, if I'm honest, I'd never had a tough day in my life. I'd, I just had this charmed, blessed life. So I, I'd, I didn't really know what it was going to be like if things went bad. If one, of my, you know, if one of my kids got really sick or, like, I've got lots of friends who have so many issues and problems with their lives, just no fault of their own. And I think that is resilience and toughness, to keep going when life is so hard. Well, for me, life was, so, life was great. And uh, so I never really knew what I'd be like in a, when, when, I, when there was nothing left in the tank. That's interesting, because I think as men, we can live with that question, but it gets suppressed. Like, not a lot of guys I wouldn't have thought would be tackling that question and looking for ways to answer it. What, what pushed you over the edge? What, what made you decide to sign up for an ultra to, to go for it? What was the crossing, the threshold? I think it was, reading the, it was reading books. I think reading books and being inspired by other guys who were like me, just regular guys who thought they're going to try and find adventure through ultra running and just reading their stories. And it's amazing. When you'd think get inspired by seeing how somebody can change and how somebody can discover the potential they've got in a certain sport that they never knew about because you don't know until you do it. And so I just... And if I'm honest, I've never been great at anything. And I, just, I think it was... People say, what's... Well, why are you doing this? What are you trying to prove with this ultra running? And maybe I was trying to prove something to myself. I could find something that I actually could be good at something. And, uh, and I was tough enough. And I think it could be just trying to prove something to myself and uh, that, that question that had never been asked. Wow. You, yeah, a question not been asked of you. That's interesting. So what, talk us through that initial, the ultra. Did you Google it? Did you just say that's the one? Like, what, what was the process? It was a local race. It was uh, it, I couldn't I couldn't miss it. It's just the rules on the. Uh, I live in Dorset, so the course path is fantastic for running, and there was an ultra being held from Charmouth on the coast. It runs up and down the really up and down hilly course on the course path from Charmouth all back to here in Pool, and uh, 80 miles, and in one go, I thought this this looks like a great one to start with. I thought it can't be that hard. I know 80 miles sounds a lot of way, but lots of people do it, and I thought it can't be that difficult. So I signed up and set off. And uh, So you trained for this? You yeah, I, well, I thought I trained. Right. I'd never done an ultra before, so I'd, I'd run a lot and just got my head around it, and just so I knew, I thought I knew what to expect and how I needed to train. Like any normal marathon? You yeah, train, you, yeah. Just, you just train. I didn't, well, I'd never done a marathon. I'd, even, I'd never even done a marathon before, so it was just, it was just straight in the deep end with the ultras. And... Uh, Halfway, 40 miles, I was complete baggage. I was an absolute mess. And I was, it was like, how, I ran 40 miles, that was enough. And I thought, I can't, how can anybody run another 40 now with nothing left in the tank? And that was my first introduction to what ultra running actually is. It's just keeping going when all you want to do is stop. And uh, so I had 40 miles of just suffering. Wow. What, what, can you describe what that's like? I mean, some of us will know some of, done endurance events or taking their bodies to that limit but what happens obviously there's physical things happening there's mental things happening can you articulate any of that battle that shutting down well your body does shut down you get to a stage and you think you just do not want to take another step you just want to stop and sit down and just jack it in and uh, and after a while it's every muscle in your body aches and you can't understand it till you do it but your neck will ache just from holding your head in the same place for hour upon hour, just swinging your arms. You buy, you've swung your arms tens of thousands of times, so your biceps are aching just from holding your arms up in the air while you're running. Obviously, your back's killing you, your shoulders are killing you from running, so you're hurting from top to bottom. Every muscle is in agony. Often you're getting the blisters are kicking in, so you've got sore back, your back's sore from your rucksack. You just hurt top to bottom, and there's just nothing left in the tank. You're just completely knackered. And it, 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 every step, you're almost counting the steps, like, you know, 100 steps at a time, and just another 100 steps, just to keep going. And that's all you're thinking about, just counting hundreds of Just keep going. Or sometimes you pick something in the distance, and you like, just get to that next cliff top, next get to that mountain, that next tree, and just to keep yourself moving. And 
it, it, I, I'm all, I, I, what helps me a little bit is seeing other people suffering so just knowing it's not just you on your own and so I think I'll try and catch up that guy in front of me he's walking so if he's walking I'm going to make sure I'm not walking and so just overtaking people and the competition side of it just drags you up a little bit to push yourself it feels like a slugfest against another guy who's who's going to just give in first but everybody's suffering the same way it's not fitness anymore so you completed that one yeah, finished it. I, I think there were only about 40 odd runners in the race. I came about 15th, and I must have been four or five hours behind the guy that came first. And I was like, I can't believe how unbelievable he's got. How can they run so far, so fast? And uh, so that was my first experience of that race. And Did yeah. you get the answer to the question you were looking for? Of am I enough? Am I strong enough? Can I do this? I did, I, at the time, I wasn't sure because when I finished the race, I thought, so that's it. I'm not going to put a pair of running shoes on ever again. That, that, this is, that was just way too much suffering. And then after a while, they kind of died off and I realised, I thought, you know what, that was, that was intense. There was something about it, the, just the raw emotion of, of going places mentally and physically I'd never been before. I thought, oh, yeah, I think I might do that again. But this time, now I know how bad it is. I've got to prepare better. I've got to train harder and just uh, and train more specifically for the event. So training-wise, some details around that. So nutrition, uh, energy, weight levels. How, how do you go about even putting a program together for an ultra? Well, weight levels, just start on that one. I always try and lose weight. Right. And my wife hates it. I look like I've come out of a prison camp on the start line of most of my races. But it's just a simple fact. The lighter I am, the faster you can run and the less effort it is to move yourself around. So I try and lose weight and get myself trimmed before a race simply to make myself lighter. And then the training, you know, I'd been going for runs and doing, you know, one hour, two hour runs and thinking that would suffice, where I realized you've got to go and run for 12 hours. And so I'd leave the house here at seven in the morning. I wouldn't get home till nighttime and just be out running in the hills all day. Just and that, that's only 12 hours, you know. Some ultras, you're running for 32, 35 hours. So you're still not scratching the surface even on a 12-hour run. Is there, is there a crossover between... So our lives are very noisy. There's noise around us all yeah. the time. Is there a moment that you could articulate, put your finger on, where you, something changes? Because you are running, you're trapped inside your own head. You're, you're yeah. with yourself. Whether you, you, maybe you're listening to music or... Is there a moment where you start to really just silence out everything and you're, you're almost just, you know you're on your own and you're running? Oh, 100%. I think that's part of the joy of it. Just, my wife doesn't understand it. She says, you know, are you not bored? Just by yourself all day. You must be bored and never, ever. I just love the peace, my own company, the solitude, the time to think. And uh, I think I wrote about an article recently when up in the mountains doing a race this summer. And... Uh, yeah, it was a six-day race, so you're out all the time, non-stop, hardly sleeping, running through the night, and this is up in the Alps. And you'd be there with just not a sound, maybe some cowbells off in the distance, and it's moonlight, running by moonlight, and you'd be one other guy, and he's maybe 50 metres behind me or in front of me, just by yourself. And I would suddenly, and I'd never known it before, but I would find myself, and I was sobbing my heart out just while I was running along, just running and crying with a pure joy. I've just been alive. And, I'd, and I'd, you'd never notice that. In normal day living, you don't experience that because you're so, you're so busy, there's so much on your mind. But I'm thinking about my wife and my kids and my mates and, and my faith. And I'm just thinking, wow, just life is incredible. And I've, t I've time to take all the noise out of my life and just focus on what really matters. And I found it was just an emotional experience I've never known before. And it was amazing. Interesting. So that's, and you know, in other words, we maybe could articulate or express that as like a not an awakening maybe but a definitely an ex, a spiritual experience like that's a, a kind of different people aren't getting that in their day-to-day -day nine to five sitting in the office like that's no, very no, unique yeah. to, to be stripped away to that place where you are at you're on your own you're at yeah. peace or you're you're connecting with who you are in a very different and deeper way oh definitely and i think a lot of guys are looking for that now. Yeah. I've got a lot of mates my age in their 50s and 60s who've never done any of these events. They don't really want to do the hard ultras, but they're desperate for adventure. And they'll call me up and say, we need to do an adventure. Let's organize something. Let's go to Brecon Beacons. Let's just do a hike. But just being away with guys up in the hills or canoeing on or down a river 
or just doing something that takes them out of their normal life, I think a lot of guys are crying out for it. Mm. Yeah, so much, I guess so much of life is safe, it's sanitised, it's pre-packaged, whereas there's a lot of risk elements to what you're doing. Yeah, well, you know, some of the races, the one I did this summer, you know, people were... People are killed during this race. The chance of being killed is a possibility all the time. So there's definite risk. But it's it's just, I keep going back to the word adventure. It's just being outside of your normal comfort zone and doing something different. And it doesn't need to be something dangerous at all. You know, it could be paddle boarding down a river, a flat river uh, for a day, no risk whatsoever. But there's something about it that feels like an adventure. Something beyond you, something that's just out of reach that you have to make effort to... Yeah. And you're not thinking about job, mortgage, finances. It's just you just your mind's uh, there just to enjoy the moment. Mm. So we've done the race in Dorset. You've got the bug for it. You started to say, "Hang on a minute." There's there's deeper questions even still. There's more I want to uncover with this. Where did that journey take you? What's the next big hurdle, or the big obstacle, or the challenge you wanted to to overcome? The, the next challenge I think was to do better. I wanted to. I thought I'm sure I can do this. And so my next challenge was to start getting myself in the situation where I can actually start competing in these races and racing rather than surviving. So that was the next challenge. So, it's And just to know, this is in your 20s, right? No, no, this is in my 40s. <laughs> and that's staggering. So you did all that, you started this journey in your 40s. Back into my 40s. That's the end of my football career. And you started doing this. So take us on the next... The next journey, you went and did the Marathon de Sable. Marathon de Sable. Tell us about it. What on earth is that? That is, it's probably one of the more famous ultra races. Uh, I think James Crackle made it famous. He did a documentary for Discovery Channel, I think called The Toughest Race on Earth. It, it definitely isn't, but it, it is brutal. It is a hard, it's six days, 156 miles across the Sahara Desert, carrying all your kit which is, I thought that was a joke the first time I heard it, because how can you carry everything you need for a week in a small backpack? But you've got, you have to carry your food, your sleeping bag, your survival kit, uh, your cooking facilities, everything has to go into one rucksack and you have to carry it across the desert in the heat. And it's 50 degrees temperatures and uh, every day, it's a different length uh, race every day from going to be 15 miles and there's one long stage that's 56 miles and you're running over sand dunes sleeping on the floor in a, in a, a makeshift tent every night. It, it just, it's a brutally hard way, week. And Laura, it's one and a half thousand competitors. So the year I did it, so it's, it's a big old race and uh, but amazing competition. Did you hit any days where the unexpected happened or where you, you came across different things that really challenged it? Or well, every, every day was tough, but there was the double marathon day was the worst day. I'd. I'd wanted to get into a certain position in the race for the start of the double marathon. And so the day before, I'd, I just ran my heart out. You know, I'm, I'm not a great runner, but I, I really wanted to be. Uh, they have, on the, on the marathon, double marathon day, they have an elite start. So all the elite athletes, they set off four hours after everybody else. So it's rather than, so they don't finish miles ahead at the end of the day, because it's such a long stage. And my ambition always to be to start with the elites. And so I'd run my socks off the day before to make sure I could get in the top 50 to go with the elite guys. But I'd made myself ill. I'd give myself really bad heat stroke, got gastric issues I couldn't eat, I was sick. And I was in a real mess. And so that morning I woke up and it took me half an hour to eat a tiny plastic cup of porridge. And I was retching every mouthful and I just really felt rough. And then for that four hours we waited for our start, I just curled up in a ball in the tent fetal position, just ill, ill, and just dreading the thought of setting off and running a double marathon across the desert with no food apart from half a, half a, bowl, half a cup of porridge. And uh, so that was just, and I, but I just knew if I could get off, get running in 12 hours, which is probably how long it would take to finish, in 12 hours of one foot in front of the other, that, that day would be over. And it, was gonna, it would be just a day of misery and suffering, which it was, I wasn't wrong, it was awful. So that was the worst day by a mile. And, and sleep in that environment? Do you even sleep? Was it just exhaustion switches you off? Uh, yeah, the sleep's not too bad. Not compared to some, compared to the one in the summer, this, this one in the, the desert. Because if you start a race, if you run for four hours, you'd be finished in the afternoon by two. And the race won't start again until eight o'clock next morning. So you've got all afternoon and the evening. You might not sleep very well because you're on the floor, just on a bit of carpet and rocks. So it's, it's uncomfortable. 
but at least you can rest in between each stage, which is uh, which is nice. Right. So you wake up, you put on your running trainers, you, your feet are mullered, you're exhausted. How do you make yourself run again? Like, what are you saying to yourself to, to move your body again? <laughs> the competition is the big one in the MDS because there's so many other runners. There's always somebody to race, and, you, and it, it felt. For me, it was, it was a proper race. And so every day I was not quite chomping at the bit, but I was keen to get started every day. I, it wasn't one of those where I had to really dig deep. Other than that double marathon day, every other day I was raring to go and I just wanted to race and see how well I could do against all these other runners. And that, that I was getting to that stage now where I felt I really wanted to compete a little bit more. And so it was, I had the challenge of racing but against other people. Was this a team event or was it solo? Like, how did that work? It's solo. You, you share a tent, uh, seven of the guys or girls. You share a tent and I only knew one guy in the tent before I got there. So you get to meet the other guys and there were just a real variety of characters. Just, I'm still friends with most of them now. You, you get really close going through all that, kind of, all that suffering together. So this is one week, but realistically, travel time, training time, recovery time, even the, even the process to be accepted onto this, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you can't just fill an application and go. Well, funnily enough, for the MDS, yes, you can. Oh, right. <laughs> All you have to do is have some cash. Wow. It's expensive. I think that's the biggest deterrent to entry. It's a lot of money to sign up for a race. You've got to fly to, the, you know, fly to Morocco, do the race. But no, it's, anyone can enter as long as you get your application form in on the right time and uh, you're in. I think that's partly why it's seen as the toughest race because most, a lot of people run there, they're not in great shape or they turn up, which means they're just going to suffer day in, day out. And the only, the only way you get kicked off the race is if you're overtaken by a guy walking a camel. There's two guys at the back of the race walking with camels and if the camels overtake you, you're out. You're out. So if you can go move faster than a walking camel, you can finish your stage. And some guys, it just takes them forever. I mean, they're walking the whole way. Uh, the year I did, Ranulph Fiennes, the, uh, the explorer, he was in the year I did, and his back went on the first day, so he could hardly walk, never mind run. And he was all stooped, and he just dragged himself around day after day. Just a huge amount of suffering. But as long as he stayed ahead of that camel, uh, he was fine. Which I say, probably explains why it's such a tough race, because they actually allow you to suffer. Where in some races, if you fall behind race times, you're gonna kicked off first day. And there's quite tight time, time, time limits, but not in the MDS. You've seen some people quitting out, just not able to even move anymore? Oh yeah, it's, it's usually with their feet. The blisters people get in the desert is, everybody in my tent, their feet were almost completely covered in bandages. Not just a, like a plaster on their big toe with a blister, but their whole foot. One of the girls in the tent, she was in a wheelchair after the race. She couldn't walk for a couple of weeks after the race. Her feet were so bad. The bit, basically the, the whole sole of her foot, from a toes to a heel, just came off. And, uh, and she kept on going on these feet for the race, just so tough. But, but it was just, everybody in my tent was just completely covered in bandages. They have 70 doctors. At the end of each stage, there's a tent with 70 doctors in there, and everybody goes in and gets all their feet dressed and fixed and iodine injections, blisters burst. It's... It's brutal, but the feet is, if anybody does the MDS, what's the worst bit, they'll tell you, it's their feet getting blisters. And, that, and, and there's nothing you could do to prevent that, that's just going to happen. Well, I, I didn't get any blisters, you so didn't get any. I didn't get any. So, but at the same time, I, I, I got obsessive about not getting blisters. You know, and, what's, uh, the, what's the pattern behind that? Share your, share your wisdom with that. The pattern is, I, I ran a lot before the race. I think people train for these things and they, they think they've trained really hard, but they haven't really. They've not put in, you know, hundreds of hundred mile weeks. If you're running a huge amount of distance, your feet do get a lot tougher and it does make a difference. It's no good to have, you know, I run, I do a 10 mile run on a Saturday and my feet are getting tough. Not really, it's just not enough. So I ran a huge amount and then I did loads of investigations of socks and there's lots of different socks you can get. and I. And there's a, there's a certain type of sock where it's made of a certain material where it causes less friction, so you get less heat in the sock. And so I searched the web to find the, the most heat, the socks that produce the least amount of heat. And then you also cover your feet in little, uh, you have like gaiters to stop the sand getting inside your shoes. But I, if I was running, the minute I felt my feet rubbing or sanding my shoes, I would stop straight away, readjust my laces, sort out my socks. But I was obsessive about not getting blisters, because I knew that could be a, a major factor in the race to ruin your, ruin your race. 
How do you get enough water in and food in to, to compensate for the calorie burn? Yeah, well, you're carrying your own food, so you, you can take as much food as you want, but you've got to carry it. Water-wise, they have a water stop at every, maybe every three, three or four miles in the desert, and so they, that's the one thing the, the organisation does do. They, you've got to carry everything apart from the water. Obviously, you carry water on the day for, for the, for, between the stages, but uh, when you get to a certain, there'll be a bunch of Land Rovers parked in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, you just turn up, there'll be 10 Land Rovers, all with guys giving out bottles of water. So you just top your water up, make you take a salt tablet for dehydration, and then you're off again. What do you reckon you were burning calorie-wise per day? I don't know. I really don't know. Thousands. It's thousands, yeah, but nowhere near as much as you're taking in. Yeah. You can't, especially that day, that 56 miles, I ran that on basically a half a, half a plastic cup of porridge, a couple of chews, and at the end I, I had a, like a milkshake drink, a, a power drink, and a half a pint, but that's all I had the whole day. So the, the calorie intake, nowhere near close to your output. What happened towards the end last day, finish line coming into focus, what, what did you feel, what happened, what was that like? It was it was it was a miracle. I, 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 the the last well, the very last day of a walk is just like a charity day. The, the the proper last day of the race is a marathon. It's a straight marathon to finish the race. At the end of the marathon, you, you get your medal, and uh, and I, and that was on the back of doing the double marathon when I'd been sick. And I woke up that morning, and I just felt raring to go. I couldn't believe how strong I felt. I'd, you know, I'd, it sounds crazy. I'd prayed about it for, for like for some sort of supernatural strength to get me through that day. And I just, and I'd never done anything like it. I, I really felt supercharged. It was just incredible. I'd set off, and for the first few miles I was running, I looked around, and I was, I was still with the leaders in the lead pack with the guys that win it, and they were all running with me. And I'm looking around, I can't believe I'm here. And there's a couple of guys I knew who were professional athletes uh, who would get sponsored by the, the top names, and they were just in the same bunch as me. And I thought, in the end, I'm, I'm, I'm going to race you. I, I feel amazing today. I'm going to try and race, race these guys. And so my race, then I was just racing these these professionals, but it was just it was unprecedented how how, how good I felt that day. And uh, so yeah, it was a great finish. Wow. But, but I just, honestly, I don't know where that came from. It just wasn't. It wasn't so me. So listening to your story, that feels like a good place. You know you. You've answered the question, this deep sort of longing, can I, what can I put myself through, who can I discover about myself, what can I... So it ends there, right? You don't do any more old things, we're done. <laughs> obviously, obviously not, because you get a taste for it in the end. I thought, right now, I, you know, I wanted to come back and do that one on the course path and have a crack at that again, do that again with all my knowledge and my training and knew what I was doing. I wanted to find bigger, harder races. And then once you get into this sport, there's some... There's races all around the world that are really famous, and that uh, you think you think you start getting a bit of a bucket list of races, or adventures, or challenges that people talk about in in this world of ultra running. And so that's all right. We'll start ticking them off and start uh, applying for races around the world and see which ones I can do. Wow. So you've done some group stuff as well, and that interests me. When I was reading about the events you've done, some you have to finish as a group. Yes. Yeah. So if if your teammates drop out, you're out. Yeah. What was that like for you? And because that's hard to deal with. That it's a lot of work, prep, your heart's in it. And if you can keep going, but a mate can't, what was that like? At the time, really hard. You know, one of the races like I think I mentioned earlier in the summer, it was a six-day race. You start off as a team of two or three. You can't finish on your own, and uh, you have to. It's too dangerous to run by yourself. So you've got to stay in a team. And twice, uh, my team members dropped out before the finish but both times it's towards the end so it's a six day race so i was either day four or day five so you've suffered hugely to get to there you're almost finished you're 24 hours 30 30 hours away from finishing the whole thing and then your last team member just drops out and you've got to stop and at the time you know gutty doesn't even cover it you just and also you're a mess anyway because emotionally you've hardly slept you're in bits and you just so disappointed that you want to finish this race but there's nothing you can do but I think what always helps me I I look at the do you know what look at trying to flip it and at the end of the day I've had a, a, um, a fantastic adventure I've had an amazing adventure that is you know, almost you couldn't believe how, how incredible it is running in the mountains at night and and I've got great mates and it's not their fault they got injured or they just had enough it, they, they can't help it so I try and flip it and look at the good side and live to live be more grateful, I suppose, 
And when you look to be grateful on these races, there's a lot to be grateful about. And so I look back and think, you know, that was amazing. I just wish I could have finished it, but everything else was, was incredible. So this race you did again in August last year? Yeah, the third, third what time. Was it? What? It, the race is called the PTL. It's, it's French for Petit Trot Lyon. It's Lyon's little walk. I think whoever invented the race, that was their joke. Because yeah. it's, uh, it's 300k across the Alps. But the big thing about it is the amount of climbing. It climbs 82,000 feet over six days, which is Everest, uh, Everest from sea level three times in a week plus 300k and a lot of it is on unmarked trails you're not on a trail you're just wilderness and this year above 2000 meters we had a foot of snow this year it snowed the weather was blizzards this is august it was the weather was horrendous you were soaked to the skin freezing cold climbing mountains for six days uh, it was uh, yeah incredible so i had a team of three uh, one of the guys dropped out on day three he just had enough and then uh, and i had the, the fourth the other guy we kept managed to keep going and so you could finish this without him? It was yeah, you have to have two, minimum oh, of two. You, two. you just can't, you're not allowed to run on your own. Right. Wow. You said about how when you started it, you saw a couple of guys, you know, drop 100 foot or so. They weren't, they just lost their footing. Yeah. So it's seriously dangerous. Oh, yeah, I just, I, I, we, you, you climb up out, out from the mount, from the valley and you just get, the, the weather was getting worse and worse and worse. And then we got into a blizzard and then we got to the point above the snow line. And it snowed, I said, about a foot of snow. At this point, it was early days, so there was maybe six inches of snow on the ground. And this is a, a really, a track on a really steep ground. And the two guys in front of me, directly in front of me, the one, one, one above me, he just missed his footing on, a, on an icy rock and just slipped. And we went straight down the side, 100 feet down the mountain, bouncing, hitting rocks, screaming. He was absolutely terrified. I think he thought his life was over. And he, he was, he then eventually stopped, hit a rock at the summit 100 feet down and just slid into it. And he's just lying there. I eventually waved his hand like, it's to say he was okay, he was survived it. And I'm like, goodness sake. And then that guy directly in front of me, he put his foot in the same place where that guy just slipped. And he went as well, 100 feet straight down the side of the mountain. It almost, he was terrified, he was swearing his head off in, in terror. He really thought he'd had it. And the same again, he's hit a few rocks, bounce, 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 and then came to an ending. And uh, he, he was moving, and he probably wasn't in my team, so I just cracked on. But my next step, where those two had slipped, I don't think I've ever put my foot down more carefully in my entire life. But yeah, it certainly, it really sharpens your mind. You think constantly, you're in, you, it's a dangerous environment. You just can't be slack or cavalier. Wow. What was it like sleeping up there in the mountains? Did you, I, I remember reading you, you talked about sleep between rocks, like just to stay standing almost. What was going on? Yeah, that, that's, that particular race, I, I think the PTL is probably one of the hardest races in the world. And because it's so hard and you've got to go so far, you don't really have time to sleep. Sleeping is uh, a premium. So the first, for example, the first three nights of that race, my total sleep in three nights was an hour and a half. So you're getting half an hour of sleep each night, and then you, but you're climbing for 20, 22 hours a day. And the rest of the time is either eating or your half an hour kip. So it's just, that it's hard to get your head around to keep going on half an hour's kip day after day after day. We're doing such a, such a hard race. But we got towards the end on about day three or day four, you're, you're hallucinating, you're falling asleep on your feet all the time. You know when you're driving your car and you start getting a bit of a nod and you think, oh, I've got to, you've got to stop and take a break. Well, it, we had that, and it was put about two o'clock in the morning, and we had a particular section we had to climb. We involved a fair amount of climbing, and uh, we couldn't afford to fall. It was too. It would. It would have been killed if we'd fallen. So we knew we had to get ourselves together. So we needed a power nap to uh, just shake it off, so we didn't fall asleep while we were climbing. And there was nowhere to sleep. It was in a boulder field, boulders the size of cars, and there was nowhere to lie down on the floor but we had to get a bit of kip. So in the end, the pair of us found two big boulders, wedged ourselves in at the waist so we couldn't fall over. And uh, once we got jammed in there, just leaned back against the rock and just had a kip. And just got half an hour of sleep, woke up absolutely freezing because we must have been two and a half thousand meters up in the mountains, middle of nowhere, freezing cold, but woke up and thought, okay, I feel a bit better now, we can crack on. But that was tough. <laughs> And running at altitude as well. I mean, that's yeah. Or the air is thin. You know, you don't. You don't after a while, you stop noticing it. But then I'll sometimes I'll, I'll shoot a video of the, a certain moment. I just notice. I'm just <gasps> you're just sucking for air, 
uh, the, the whole time, just because you can't, the air is thin. It's, it makes a big difference climbing mountains when it's above two and a half thousand meters. So before we talk about the end of that race, mental conditioning to be able to keep yourself moving and not quit. Because any sort of endurance stuff, you start to battle with yourself. There's this inner war of yep. stop, you've done enough, there's nothing to prove. How do you start to tackle that battle that goes on inside? There's, there's a lot of ways. And just an example, I think that race, that race in the French Alps, the Petit Trot Lyon, that race is different from the one in the, the Marathon de Sable. As in, you're not even allowed to do that race unless you are a fully experienced mountaineer with, with a lot of ultra running under your belt and you have to send in a CV and it goes to a committee and they, they won't, because it's dangerous and hard, they won't let you do it unless you've got this CV of adventure and ultra running. So, and, but on that particular race, 20% of the field dropped out on the first day. And, uh, and they knew what they were doing. Some of them had done it before and still couldn't get past day one. It, it was so tough. And, uh, and people ask me, how, how come you keep going when other people stop? Because a lot more, I would say most of them are younger than me and, uh, and certainly in better condition. And I, I started thinking about what is it that keeps me going when all you want to do is stop? And, and I realized it wasn't just one thing. It was lots of different factors. And so I started writing them down. And in the end, I started speaking to groups and just going through the, my top 10 reasons uh, why you just keep going when you want to give up. So what would you say are some of those key things? Because there'll be blokes listening who, they're not running the Alps, but they're in jobs they hate. They're in situations that have drained all their life. What, what are some of the some kind of key things that yeah. you say, look, here they keep going? Every time, for me, the number one, the, there's nothing else close to this, is the connectivity with somebody else, with, with friends. Having somebody by your side when you're going through hell. And uh, with these races, uh, sometimes you, you metaphorically by your side, as in they're, they're watching you. Like the PTL, you've got your teammates by your side who are helping you all the time. And that's immense, having teammates to keep you going and talk you through the dark sections. But also, I, the support I had from friends back in England was incredible. I, I mean, you'd have your phone. You don't have a signal most of the time. And you could be 3 o'clock in the morning on some glacier, in the middle of the night, pitch black, and suddenly you get an area of where you got some reception, and my phone will just ting, 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 and I'll think, what on earth? And it's just message after message after message of people back in England, middle of the night sometimes, and they've got up in the night, and they're watching my tracker, my dot on the computer, and they see where I am. And they say, they'll send a little message, saying, just watching you, thinking about you, praying for you, cheering you on, keep going. And the thought of having all these people just watching your dot, from England or around the world, there's people in the States following me, and uh, you think all these people are cheering me on, on their computers at home, and knowing you got the support of people around you, is is immense. And it just, I think, how could I ever not finish when I got so many people cheering me on, and uh, having those closer relationships by your side. So you say men who are in bad jobs or wherever is, you know, wherever their life is like, it's a lot more bearable when you got somebody by your side, when you got a mate, and uh, and. A lot of men, I've, I've since this go, don't have close mates. You know, I read some articles somewhere by some guys are struggling to find best men when they get married. And a lot of guys now, young guys, they don't develop these close relationships with, some, with another guy where they can just be accountable, tell them their worst secrets, tell them their issues, and just have somebody to bounce off and somebody to cheer them on when things get difficult. And so in all these races, without a doubt, my number one driver for resilience is having somebody by your side. Mm. Wow, that's really powerful. How, uh, how has this affected your life in your, in your faith? Because you know, you, you, you've got a faith in God and has there been any questions answered in these experiences, these ultra marathons, or what you've been learning through the process about you that have reflected into your faith and, and helped you understand more about who God is and how you believe him? I think, obviously, finding more about yourself makes, it, makes a difference. To, uh, how you perceive your faith and your relationship with God, and I think, and also being in the mountains. Like I said earlier, sometimes because when you got that solitude and the quiet, I'll, I'll often just be praying while while I'm walking or running, and just it's in your own head. And sometimes you feel a real closeness to God that you do, it's hard to get in my day to day living with the kids running around or or work and being in a rush. And some of, some of the spiritual experiences I've had up in the mountains have been almost unparalleled. I just that. Because there's no there's no distraction, 
and you, and also there's, there's a lot less of you in you. <laughs> You're kind of broken. Although I must say, I'd, for somebody who said these experiences, they break you. I think they fix me. I think, yeah, yeah I just feel fixed and uh, through, through going through this. Yeah, that's something I wrote down that I quoted. You'd said, repaired in a place of brokenness, like through breaking, there was a real repairing. Yeah. It's fascinating. It isn't. It? It's repairing it, it, everything about you. Just you know, with the, whether it's your connection with your family or your kids or your faith, it's uh, when when you're in that sort of situation and you're just so spent, you suddenly think you're almost like back to back to basics, mm -hmm. and you start thinking, "What is it about all the things I have that makes my life so special?" And you have time to focus on the, that you wouldn't normally have time to give it that much time and attention. Mm -hmm. and I think it's great. It's great for my, all, all aspects of my life uh, benefit from these experiences. So let's come down a mountain. You've had two failed attempts at this one. Yeah. What happened this time? We just kept on going. It was, it was, it was, it, because it was so hard this year with the snow and the rain, everybody had wet feet from the very first half an hour, your feet were soaked and you're just sludging through snow and mud for days on end and your feet took an absolute battering to the point where I could hardly put one foot from the other. It was agony. And on the very last day, there was the David, my French friend, there's two of us, only two of us left now. We had 22K to go. And I'm, I'm laid in a refuge on the floor and I had to go to the loo and it was about 10 meters. And it took me forever to get 10 meters and back to my seat. I thought I've got 22K to go to finish this race and my feet hurt so bad, I'm struggling to walk across the room. And so I'm standing, I'm sat, I get back to me, I'm sat there, I think, right, okay, watch the maths on this. And I find myself doing the maths, so that's, 44,000 more steps to go, and all this pain is over. And that was it, so we just, I said, we're gonna have to set up earlier, so my feet are too bad, I can hardly move. We have to, so we, added, we cut down our sleep that night, set off in the middle of the night so we could finish in the morning, and, uh, and cracked on, but it was just one foot, literally one foot and the other, every, every foot was agony, just, but I knew I'd say 44,000 of them, and just count them down almost, till it was over. But finishing in Chamonix, to run back into town, but there was friends there, my family, I didn't see my wife for six days, and just, it was immense. Just knowing I'd done it after three attempts, six days in the mountains, no, I, I had six hours sleep in total for the whole week, and, uh, and to see my wife, big hug for my wife, it was very, oh, massively emotional. Wow, it's very inspiring. Now you're, I want to know what's next. You're in your 60s. Yeah. What's next? Next, there's, there's always something else, and uh, but it's all with permission from my wife, actually, because it takes such a big time out of our life from when I'm training, and also when these races, it's a week out of our holidays, you know. It's, so our summer holidays, I'm going to spend a week in the mountains where I don't see her. And I, for me, it's a big ask on her. And uh, so I promise this year nothing, but next year there's another race, uh, a very famous race called the Tour de Gion, which is the equivalent of the PTL, only it's in Italy, and this is over 400k. So it's like the PTL, only 100k further. And I think that would be, I don't know any races that are harder than that. And, but I think, I think, I think I really struggle to do the 300k. So how I can do 400k, I have absolutely no idea. Cause I, and I will be two years older. So it could be a pipe dream. You know, you can talk about these things all day long, but until you do them, that's a, that's a different story. And so I don't want to talk it up or big it up too much, but also getting in is a problem because they're very popular. But I'd like to apply 2025 to the, for the Tour de Gion. And that would be, I think that'd be my last big race. Wow. Let's end it on something to blokes who are watching and just have heard that whisper and that voice of give up. It's, it's too hard, you can't go any further, just stop. What would you say to those blokes listening today? I think from what I've discovered in the races I talk about is when you think you've had enough and there's nothing left in the tank, that you're not even close. There's a guy called David Goggins, he's, he's quite famous now, he's all over Instagram, and Goggins has this 40% rule he talks about, and he's done them all, he's ex-Special Forces, Navy SEAL, he's done all the big races as well, he's an ultra nut, but he's, he works on the 40% basis, and he just says, you know, when you're 40%, when you're done, and there's not a drop of strength left in the tank, you're only at 40%. There's another 60% to play with. And he says, you're not even close. So it's just encouraging guys, when you think you're at your tether, you're not. 
you're not even close. There's so much more we're capable of. There's, we're so much stronger than we think we are. And then you also, but also think, how can I build my resilience? What can I do? Rather than just accepting life's tough, life's hard, what can I do to build my resilience? And there's lots, you know, resilience is learnable. What can I do to make myself stronger? And, you know, I said the first one there, that whole get close to some mates. Get some mates in your life that, that you're, you've invested in and spent time with and built relationships with that are going to be beside you when, when things get tough, which it's inevitable. Life gets tough for all of us. It's an absolute given. And having mates by your side is so good. But then there's all other different strategies you can have. You know, I've got about 10 of them, I think, I've, I've kind of picked up that just help you keep going and think how, you know, look into this, read books. And, and your faith is, you know, for me, my Christian faith is huge. It makes a massive difference. You know, I, I talk, when I do my talk, I, I've got a brought here actually. I always bring these into my talk, which is how you can see there, my, my walking poles. And I, I had them on my very first race in the mountains, I had them in my bag and they weren't coming out because I was like, walking poles are for old people. There's, I said, why are all these people using walking poles in the mountain? They're for weak people who are old and I'm, I've never had poles before in my life and I'm not using them. And so I kept them in my bag. But everybody else in the whole race, everybody apart from me, was using their poles. And eventually one of the guys in my team said, Finley, just get your poles out, give them a try. I got my poles out and it was like, whoa, <laughs> this makes a huge difference. It made it so much easier on the big climbs. And I think so often that's the Christian faith. A lot of guys, they just see the Christian faith as something for guys who are a bit weak, old people. It's just not for them. And they'll do anything but pick those poles up and give them a try. And, uh, and for me, it's been, it's, I've seen it in other guys who've just resisted forever and ever and ever. And one day something happened in their lives and they, they'll come to faith and they'll be like, oh, why didn't I pick those poles up 20 years ago? Because it makes so much difference in every aspect of your life. And so yeah, I think that's, that's how I'd want to finish.